Thank you very much, and it's a delight to be here. Thank you for the invitation to come and speak about our work. Most of my research over the past 10 or 15 years has been in imaging, both how to image cultural and heritage material, how to deliver it to people, and then wondering who's looking at it once we put it up there. For the past 40 years, most libraries, archives and museums have been engaged in how can we use computational technology to deliver some things to our user community. So this predates the internet. Back in the 1960s, 1970s, people were already thinking about how to digitise stuff and deliver it to people. Of course, given the World Wide Web, most museums, libraries, archives have a website, and there's an expectation nowadays that you would put your collection online. With that comes the rhetoric that it increases access to the collection. Citizen science will begin. People will begin able to do things that they haven't done before if they can access the collection online. You won't have to travel to New York to see this one document, which is over there in the New York Public Library. You can sit at home on your laptop, on your sofa, and access it. You can also reunify collections which have been dispersed and put them all together. This is all fantastic, and we love digitization. We work on how to do it properly and how to use new imaging technologies, specifically how to uh, read damage and deteriorate things. But also, we're very interested in the whole aspect of digitization, how you do it, how you do it properly, and who is using it. This question, though, of who is using it has become very... It has become very important these days because of the economic climate. Just like anything else, funding bodies, especially in the UK and across Europe, don't have as much money as they did in the 1990s to plough into digitisation initiatives. And now governments and funding bodies are asking, well, where's the proof? Where's the proof that this has actually changed scholarship? Where's the proof that people have actually been using this stuff? Most libraries, archives and museums have not been forthcoming or very open about who is using their online collections and why they're using them. And most of them don't know, they don't have the money or the time to investigate. So now we've been asked to suddenly prove this investment for 40 years worth of digitisation and we don't really know who's been using it or what we can prove so that we can fund more digitisation for the future. So what we're interested in is who is coming to use these collections and what are they doing with them when they actually get there. The British Museum Collection Database Online is a, a really great uh, case study for this. As Matthew said, it was launched in 2007. By the end of 2009, there were 2 million objects online. Over 600,000 of those had one or more images associated with them. At the moment, there are 670,000 objects which have one or more images. So it's an increasing amount of things which are going online, increasing amount of images which are being put online. And this demonstrates a phenomenal investment in time and energy and effort and infrastructure to do this over a number of years. So I do not come here to bury the British Museum. I come here to praise it for the effort and then to look at who is using this collection. What do we know or what can we know? And how can we find out who is using this collection online? We have some experience at UCLD, it's University College London Centre for Digital Humanities, um, doing user studies specifically in the cultural and heritage sector. We've done some log analysis of internet resources in the arts and humanities, and I'll talk about log analysis in a minute and what that actually means. We've worked with digital libraries, with people, with experts in human-computer interaction to see how people are using digital libraries and how we can make them better for people to use. We've done some research with archaeologists in the field to look at how we can take technology into the trench and speed up the archaeological dig process. We've got an ongoing project just now called Curator at the Grant Museum at UCL, which won a big award a couple of weeks ago, where we are putting QR codes and iPads into the museum and seeing how we can get people to engage more with museum content. I have a raft of PhD students working with the British Library, the British Museum, the Science Museum, the Peach Museum, the Grant Museum, all looking at user studies of digital material and digital outreach and how people are using them and what they're doing it with. This particular study I want to talk about was done in combination with a, a research assistant of mine called Claire Ross and a work placement student, one of our master's students, who came here for six weeks over the summer to do some work with Matthew and his colleagues. And we decided to do a study looking at who was actually using the database collection online. Now, how this kind of came about is uh, we had Claire to work on another project, but she had a few weeks where she wasn't doing much. So we, we used her time wisely and, and we were able to do a little bit extra than we said we were actually going to work. So we were based on a project called Linksphere, which she got to come down to the British Museum and, and help out with this study. 
So we want to study how people are using collections online. How would you do that? There are two ways to do it. One quantitative, so you can count people. And one qualitative, you can ask the kind of vague reasons about why they would do things, what they're, uh, why they would come and do things, what they're using the things for, the stuff that you kind of need a sentence to answer for. And to do quantitative analysis of this kind of thing, you need to look at server logs. What are server logs? Every time you access a website, you leave a digital trace of the fact that you sent a request to that server to send you back some stuff. And if you set up your server properly, the server keeps a list of every single request it's had for a text file or for an image or for a movie or for a virtual reality model, anything that's sitting on that server. So the server generates these huge files of people from all over the world who are coming to look at this. We can also tell how long people have been there from. We can tell um, where they came from. It depends on the setup of people's individual computers. We might be able to tell that someone came from Cambridge. We might be able to tell that someone came from a specific lab at UCL. Sometimes we just know the country. So it's not an exact science. In general, we don't know the name of the person sitting behind the computer. We also don't know if that person got up and left the computer and someone else sat down straight after them and looked at the same website. So it's not exact, and we have to interpolate between them. But we can look at logs, we can look at links, as in which websites point to each other, and we can use commonly available tools now, such as Google Analytics, to actually uh, see and analyze this very easily from our own desktops. The qualitative means, this is the kind of thing we do in information studies at UCL, we do a lot of surveys, interviews, focused groups to try and uncover the stuff which the qualitative or quantitative stuff just can't tell you. You might know that you're getting a lot of people from New York coming to look at your website, but you will never know why. And asking them this question is the thing that you need to do to uncover that. If you're interested in this at all, there is a fantastic resource called the Toolkit for the Impact of Digitized Scholarly Resources, which was developed, funded by the JISC Funding Council, and it's available from the Oxford Internet Institute. And they run you through how to do all of this type of stuff if you want to evaluate an online collection or an online digital resource. So I would say that's the first place to start if you're interested. So here we have the kind of things that we can do. If we use Google Analytics as the way we're going to look at this, who's coming through the website, we can find out where people are from. We can know how long they are on the website, what, how many pages they're visiting at the time. We can tell the traffic sources. That is, did they come in through a Google search or from a Yahoo search or did they come from a different link? Who's pointing traffic to your website? We can do online surveys to get some in-depth answers from people, but they have to elect to reply to the survey. And we can also undertake in-depth interviews so that we get one-to-one -one responses from people. In this study, because it was only six weeks' time, we did not have the time to do in-depth interviews with a whole range of users. And we'd like to do that in the future, contacting a whole bank of people. We have their contact details now. And getting back in touch with them and asking them more about their own personal use of the collection. So some up-to-date context. Um, in the last calendar year, there were 10.5 million visits to the British Museum online. There were, however, 60 million page views, which means, on average, that every person that comes is looking at five web pages. 30% of these people were looking at the visiting and what's on section. So 30% of people were saying, well, what's on and what time is the British Museum open? And that's natural, right? If you think about how you use a, uh, a museum web page, you're mostly, a lot of the time, looking for access information, how to get there, when it's open, that kind of thing. Of the 10 million visits, 1.2 million included a visit to the research section. So there's a lot of people coming to the research co section, co which contains the collection online. But when they got there, they were responsible for 29% of all page views. So when you come, the small amount of people are coming to the research section, but they're looking at many, many more pages once they get there. So they're coming there to do something. Just to pause for a minute and think how this is, relates to the physical visits to the museum. In the same time period, there were 58 8 million physical visitors to the museum. So there are, more, more, there are double the amount of virtual visitors now than there are physical visitors. And what is our relationship of the physical museum to the virtual museum? That's something we're still grappling with. What should the virtual museum be in relation to the physical? And is there a connection? And should we make that connection clear? And it's something that people in museum studies have been talking about for a long time. 
The study that we did was looking at stats from um, 18th of June 2009 to 17th of June 2010. We looked at over 8 million visits in total. On average, people looked at six pages. 30% of people returned to the site. So there's 70% new users every single time. 230 countries came and nearly a million people searched for something on the web page. But when they were searching on the general search, they were saying things like Rosetta Stone, Egypt, Mummy. This is not the stuff that we are really interested in. We are interested in when people go to another level and look at the collection database and are doing more specific searches for things rather than where is the Rosetta Stone in the museum. In that time, there were 37 individual searches of the collections database, so that is what we're looking for. And most people, when they search the database, they then spend a minute on the site. So they're doing something. They search, they get some results, and they're reading them. And 30% of these people are returning. Do remember that figure. We have 30% returning people who come back and use the database over and over again. When you look at the stats, you get a lot of really dry data that comes out. You get this kind of thing, a chart, which is, you know, fantastic. We can see that when people are coming to search the database, 60% of people are coming through Google. So they're asking how to search the database through the, typing that into Google and then get directed to the museum. The interesting thing for us is 21% of people are coming directly to search the database online. So they've got a bookmark somewhere on their computer that they, or they know where it is. And that's really interesting because that means that people are, are taking it seriously and have it and they'll use it regularly and are coming. Um, Another interesting thing about this is 15% of, of uh, people who are coming to look at the collection database online come from somewhere other. So we looked at where people were coming from. They come from websites like, not surprisingly, Wikipedia, but also there was a lot of people coming from the British Museum shop online. So they see something in the shop and then they're coming to search for it in the actual catalogue. So that's kind of interesting how there's a link there. So there's a very prominent link in the British Museum shop and they're coming back into the collection to search for it itself. You can see some interesting social things as well. This is um, how many mo people looked at the British Museum website on a mobile device during that period. There are absolutely no hits until the middle of October, towards the end of October. Why would that be? because the iPhone came out in the middle of October. So we can see suddenly, bam, no one can get online with your mobile device. And then suddenly, wee, there you go. And you know, that's going up and up and up. People are starting to really access museum through a mobile device. You can also see things like, um, does this have a pointer on it? Sorry, this thing? Well, here it is. Here, there must have been a server outage. No one could see the museum. And uh, here, anyone got any idea what that is? It's after November the 25th. That's Christmas Day. People don't search the collections database on Christmas Day, who would have thought? So you can see some various trends of things that's through. And one of our jobs is to go through and sift all this. If you're interested in the analysis of this, we do have a paper that was published in Museums of the Web. You can go and see some of the more charts, some of the more statistical stuff that came out. We then put a survey um, online for a, a month, which targeted every second to fifth user that was coming to the web page to ask them about their motivations for coming and looking at the collections online. We got two and a half thousand responses. That's amazing. I mean, no one answers uh, web surveys. So we, that's a fantastic response rate and it really allows us to talk confidently about what people are saying. Only half of those people completed it because it was 30 questions long. So we did have quite a drop off rate towards the end, but that was okay. We knew that was going to happen. So we had, all, we had front loaded the kind of questions we needed and then we were getting more and more kind of amorphous questions towards the end, which are interesting for us, but people are not necessarily going to actually uh, carry out. So we had 30 questions, various ways to do it, and we also had four defined tasks that we sent people to find stuff in the collections database to see how they were actually using the search facility. So what I'm going to do now is present some of the results. Who is using the British Museum database online and why are they using it? These charts are a bit dry, so to help you out, I've put a gold star towards the top, the top answer and then silver stars towards the second answer. So most people using the British Museum Collection Online are 21 to 30 years old. So it's not school kids, right? This, these, are, these are slightly older group that are using it, or at least the people that answered the survey and above. So we've got a whole spread of people there who are using the survey, uh, the um, collection database online. 29% of people who are using it are from the UK. 91% of those were from England. 6% for Scotland, 3% for Wales. 
most of the people from England were actually in London. So the most, most visitors of the collection database are actually based in London when they do their search. 17.6% of people were from the States, and then we have the traditional long tail with Germany, Italy, France, Australia, and then a long tail of countries following after. We asked people how they heard about the collection online, and this was interesting for us because most people had heard about it from a colleague. It wasn't from a Google search, it wasn't from someone, it was someone had told them about it, that they should be using it. So word of mouth, especially in the scholarly community, is really important still. That's kind of interesting to know that it's not just about upping your digital presence, it's also making sure that you hit the right networks to get your collection used by people. Academic environments are also very important. So um, academic staff, fellow students, etc., libraries within institutions, or f and then from the link on the museum's website itself. So the academic network is as important a point to the collection as the museum's website. We asked people what was the, the reason that they were using the collection database online and 50% of people were using it for academic research. Now this kind of proves that thing of like, yes, if you put a collection online that uh, people would use it to do bona fide research. But we never had statistics before to actually show that and we can show that of these people that, that answered the survey, 50% of people were coming here specifically to do some research. Other people were doing it on non-academic professional research and personal interest, but that's a really, it's a whole spread of reasons why, but at the same time, it's good to know that, that people are using it for a core research for getting bona fide information about objects. We asked them what, if they were an academic, what kind of academic were they? Uh, most people using the database were postgraduate students. And you might go, oh, postgraduate students are just students, but actually, postgraduate students are doing really cutting edge research. These are the people who are really digging around and trying to find new stuff, whether they're masters or whether they're PhD. So this shows that the database has been used for really, really novel research. Following that is professors that use it. So it's just quite serious research that people are using the database for. We asked people, how do you expect to be able to search? And unsurprisingly, a lot of people wanted to search by free text exactly the same type of search as you would have in Google. That's because people learn about how to behave on websites from other websites before they come to yours. So they've learned how to search on Google and then they expect to be able to search in exactly the same way when they come to the British Museum. But people also want to look at the type of object. So uh, it might be a period or, or uh, vases, something like that. They want to be able to search in that way. So they're looking for what we would call in information studies a faceted search, where they can choose different ways to go through the collection and to sift it out. They're also interested in the date, not so interested in things like uh, by museum gallery. They're not that's not of interest to, to most people, which again shows this interesting uh, link between the physical gallery and the website and whether or not we should be thinking about laying out websites in the way that reflect the physical layout of the collection. When we asked people what they were looking for, they said a specific object. That means that most people know what they're, look, what they're looking for before they come and they want to find more information about it. So they're using it as a resource to verify information and to check information. We asked people about the type of objects they searched for on this visit, and this is, um, shows an interesting quirk in the language. What type of object? And we got a whole range of answers from vases to Italian. Um, so it shows the different ways that people perceive what you mean by type. But there's an interesting link there that people, most people are looking for prints. Most people want to see prints that they can't easily get access to. We asked people, how often do you use the collection database online? And 3% of them use it every day. So they've got some really keen users there. Only 27% of people said that this is the first time that they are using the collection online. Now, that should ring a little bit of alarm bells because previously I said that we have 30% of people who are returners. But here we're saying that only about 30% of people are using it for the first time. So it should, so should be the other way around, right? So that means that this is a self-selecting survey, that it's people that come back all the time just to answer the questions. So this, therefore, the results are a wee bit skewed and we have to acknowledge that. But that's okay. This kind of research, you're never going to get perfect answers. You just have to acknowledge the statistics that you've got. We acknowledge that it was keen people that use the collections all the time that answered that. But then it can be interesting for us to, to get some um, results from that. We asked them some opinions about the collection online. They said it was easy to find, 
They said that the layout and the collection was uh, appropriate. They said that it was easy to navigate, but some people slightly agreed with the fact that it was easy to navigate. So we asked them why, and they gave us some improvements, which I'll go through later. And most people wanted to come back and visit again. So this is all fantastic stuff, and it shows that there's a well-used, well-loved resource for people, which is, is great to be able to articulate that for the people that have put all the investment in to put it online. We asked again about this thing about physical location of objects, and people wanted to learn a little bit more about that. When we asked about improvements, the big thing was people wanted to see more images. Now, this isn't terribly surprising. People love images. But it takes a long time to scan in images, so that's a bit of an issue. It just will take time to scan in images or take photographs of images of all these objects. But people would like to see more images, more detailed records, and more things about provenance and 360-degree uh, views of objects, that kind of thing. So the improvements people want were more images, high-resolution images, zooming and enlarging images, less steps for image retrieval once you've logged on, uh, option to return to the search page. There was some about the way that people were going through the website they wanted to change. They also wanted more objects. Not all of the objects in the museum are actually online, so keep adding more objects, provide greater description of objects, and provide references. So there's a whole list of things we could then give to the web team. Was, this is what people would want if you wanted to make any changes. We asked about social media, and if people wanted to link up the database to social media, over 65% of people said they did not wish to use social media linked to the database. They were not interested in linking up to Facebook or Twitter. This is somewhere that they're coming to do serious research. They're not terribly interested in linking it up. So that's something you can say, well, we'll put social media to one side for a, a second. We asked if people were going to reuse the images that they found elsewhere. 9% of people said, I wasn't looking for images. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> Nearly half of them are not going to reuse it. But there's a lot of reuse going on. And we don't know what people do with images. Once they've got them from museum collections, we don't know what they're doing with those images next. That's a huge research question. What are they doing next with it? We asked them if they were on the British Museum's website as a result of the visit, of the visit to the museum. And there isn't really a correlation between that. It's a separate thing. And people in the comments said very, very um, pointed things about the difference between visiting the museum and actually looking at the collections database to do research. And then we sent them some tasks. I put up a picture of a pot. I know this pot very well from my undergraduate days. And I asked the following question, so just think about this. You are searching for a Greek vase, which you know is in the British Museum, as you have seen it in a print catalogue. It's an attic black-figured lithos from around 490 BC, which depicts the myth of psychostasia, the weighing of souls. The print catalogue gives the reference B639. What would you type in the search box to find the object that you're looking for? Come on, give me some. What would you type in if you're looking for that? B639. OK. If you typed in B639, you would get 48 people who did that, and you would get 14 search results, all of which are incorrect, and you wouldn't find the pot that you were looking for. If you typed in psychostasia, 23 people tried that, you would get no results, and you wouldn't find the pot you were looking for. And if you typed in lithos Le psychostasia, 9 people tried that again, you wouldn't find it. So that's a problem, right? 174 people tried this task and only six people could find that pot from that very detailed description. So this is the kind of thing we fed back and went, you know, this is a bit of an issue. The problem is it's not B space 639, it's B639 all concatenated that you have to put together. So it's a thing that we could feed back straight away and go, you know, there are some tweaks you might want to make to your search algorithm. The same thing for this scroll. You're searching for a hanging scroll with mountain landscape, which you've seen in the British Museum's print catalogues, an ink painting on paper. 16th century, attributed to K Shokei. The print catalogue gives the reference Japanese painting ADD 387. What are you going to search for if you're searching for this? What words are you going to use? Yes, most people did that, and that brings up the correct results. So there are things about the database that, that kind of need to be tested. And you expect that when you do this kind of testing, to be able to feed back concrete examples of the kind of tweaks people should be making to their collection. You can also compare at the end of all of this some of the stats that you get from the log analysis versus the stats from the survey. So on the 
left hand side here, we have the survey responses and the number of people that, that actually did the survey. So 395 people were from the UK. So the most amount of people were from the UK. And on the right hand side, we have the stats from Google of the number of visitors that come to the British Museum and the, come to the collection online page. So statistically, we have the same kind of countries, United Kingdom, United States, France, all the way down. So this is nice for us because it suggests to us that we are getting a good spread of users from all around the world in about the same way as we are getting from the logs. So we can say, therefore, OK, we've got keen users answering the survey, but it is vaguely representative of the community who are using it. So these results stand. So what are our conclusions from all this? I believe that this type of work enhances our understanding and awareness of how scholars are using digitised collections, and in particular, the British Museum's information environment. We have shown from this simple survey and log analysis that digital resources are used extensively by academics as part of the research processes. We've got proof. We've got proof of all the things people have been saying all along. We have shown that collections with a strong visual element are particularly useful. People love images and they love to look at actual things. We have shown the distinction between a physical and online visit. The physical visit is a leisure activity, but the online visit is for research and information value. So it's completely different things. We have shown that social media isn't always the answer to everything and that people don't always want all the bells and whistles and be able to share everything on Facebook and Twitter. They want to actually come down and do some work with some things. We have shown that academics display specific information-seeking behaviour. So we did a, a special little analysis on them and showed that they look for a known object, they use specific search terms, they show specific goal-driven intent. They're really keen academics. They're really keen to find what they actually want to find in the database. And this kind of study gives us a better understanding of search patterns for people and information seeking behaviour so we can then develop databases in a way that people expect to use them, make our databases better, make our searches better and make the content that we deliver to people better. It's a valuable guide for further development and a refinement of the museum online collections. Um, it shows a couple of areas of improvement, but it mostly demonstrates that why would anyone bother to, to come and visit the British Museum collection online? It is very well used and it is very well liked, which is a really great thing to report back to the web team. What's next? We would like to do some longitudinal research and how things change over time because this research was done two years ago. And we did plan to re follow it up last summer, but I went and had twins instead, so we couldn't do that. Um, but we do plan in future to go back and look at how this is changing over time and how people's needs are changing over time, especially as IT skills are, are changing over time as well and access to the internet is changing. We've just put a major bid in to one of the funding councils to do a two-year longitudinal study with another place with the portico, the National Gallery, and the British Museum and the National Library of Wales and the Petrie Museum at UCL. So we're waiting to hear about that successful so that we can track and trace users in a much more detailed way over a two-year period to see and give concrete evidence and of the value and impact of digitised resources. And all that I have to say to conclude to all that is um, thank you very much to Matthew and David at the British Museum. Thanks also to Claire Ross, my research assistant, who's now my PhD student at UCL, and Vera, who is now gone off to do fantastic things at the BBC in the, the digital realm. I also have to thank Matt Novak, who's known as Paleo Future on Twitter. He allowed us to use this image. He put this, I saw this fly by on Twitter. He scans in old comics that have visions of the future. And this is a real comic from 1962, which says researchers thousands of miles away may consult books in the Library of Congress or the British Museum. We know that they may do it, but we have shown that they're actively doing it for bona fide reasons, and they really enjoy it when they do. Thank you very much. Um, just before I ask, quest um, ask for questions, I was just going to say that um, we are in the process of redesigning the interface to our um, collection online database, and which should be online later this summer and um, a lot of the, the stuff we've got from surveys um, and, and, and the UCL's work is, is kind of fed into that and they're going to be some of the first people who see the, the beta version and help kind of rip it apart and tell us whether we've done it wrong. Um, so thank you very much Melissa. I um, always find, um, find it interesting hearing about our audiences. Um, if there are any questions from the, from, from the audience, over, up here sir. First question, how do we get some of your research students to come to our museum and uh, do this for us? Where are you? Uh, welcome Collection. 
Well, see this person sitting in the middle with the glasses? That's Julianne. And you need to talk to Julianne there because she organises student work placements. Uh, we have yeah. about um, 25 master students on, in UCLDH and another 25 electronic communication and publishing students. In fact, I know because we've just run some stats that we have 185 students this year from our department, all at master's level, out on work placement to 164 different institutions around Bloomsbury. Okay. So yes, we're always Perhaps looking for we'll more. One, we're always looking for more. So yes, okay. talk to Julianne. Thank you. Um, serious question. Um, how this kind of, I'm, I'm interested to the extent at which this kind of concentrated on scholarly users and demonstrating yeah. the, re, the kind of usefulness of the yes. collections to scholarly users. How would you go about kind of looking at its usefulness to non scholarly users? Would you do kind of concentrate on the segments that are in the same picture or would you start out the research in a different way? Um, I think it's a different suite of questions that you want to be asking. We very much did. Are you an academic? If so, go and answer all these questions. And if not, then let's do something else. But for a first pass, we wanted to, to focus on a certain audience. And we did certainly plan to go back. We do plan to go back and look at a much wider audience because this uh, evidence of impact and outreach is becoming much more important, especially with digitization. But also, um, I know that I just presented about scholarly use, but it's wrong to think that there's not bona fide research that, that doesn't happen outside of university. And we, I'm very involved with a project called Transcribe Bentham um, about crowdsourcing and how we can crowdsource uh, transcripts of historical documents. And we have got fantastic volunteer labour doing fantastic works, and none of these people are people at a university. So uh, there's a kind of false distinction. Just because you work at university doesn't mean to say you're a good researcher, and just because you don't work at university doesn't mean to say you're incapable of research. So that, you know, there's an issue there that we have to deal with. But you're right. We're hampered by the fact that the only way to get in touch with people is, well, or know what people are doing, is through the logs or through the surveys. Um, so we have to tread careful after that, and then collecting people's information, and then you do the focus groups, then you do the interviews. So we're always hampered by that, and there's always going to be a slight disconnect about how many people we can get in touch with and how well we can outreach to people. But I think the response rate that we got for the survey over a month was phenomenal. So people are interested in contributing back to the resource that they're using, and we'd hope to reach out to people in the same way, but just with a different suite of questions. We've actually found there's a skew on our general um, web surveys that uh, the majority of people who, a lot of the people who reply are collection online users because you can see in the free comment field, it, you know, we say, have you got anything else to say? And they, they come up and they, it's nearly always about the collection online. Um, Tanya. Um, I've got a very deep voice at the moment following a thyroid operation, but um, I wanted to say a few things. First, it's true that the design um, of the collection online interface um, is going to be improved. One of the reasons I think people aren't finding what they want, and the examples you gave, you know, those le lekythos and complicated examples are good ones, is because they're not using the advanced search. Uh, the advanced search isn't terribly user-friendly at the moment. We often have to explain to people how to use it. However, what it does do, and which you haven't acknowledged at all, unfortunately, is that one of the reasons I think researchers find the database useful is because we have developed incredibly good terminologies, that's right, names, and a lot of things are controlled. In the case of a name, for example, it's a simple example, um, there can be various ways of spelling a name, and since we have names from all over the world, this is terribly important that you do use the advanced search where it'll pick up an alternative names. Now, because the advanced search is being improved, I'm hoping that you'll see a very different result as to why people aren't using it now, and perhaps we'll use it later. But the level of results um, is really determined by which kind of search you use. And for place names, for types of materials, for types of objects, people often go for higher level things like metal or China, the word China as a country. If you do a free text search for China, you're going to get to China in all sorts of contexts. I don't think you stress this side at all. The other thing I'd like to question slightly is you know, your analysis at the conclusion that a physical visit is leisure, but this sort of visit is research. You haven't mentioned the fact there are loads of student rooms in the British Museum. A lot of the visits are academic visits, and they do come and look at the objects in those student rooms. And you, know, to give, to, so you have to balance, I think, the types of visits you're referring to. And another thing I want to say is that you know, we have got an enormous collection. When people say they want more objects, I think it's quite useful to understand that we've got two million records. The collection varies from being estimated at six or seven million. But a lot of the remaining objects are archaeological uh, shirts or tokens or book plates. There is still an enormous amount to be done, but you know, a large part of the collection is out there. 
Another thing I also, I'm sorry, want to say is when we analyze survey results, we have to be careful. I, I didn't quite agree with your um, explanation for why so many people look at prints. They look at prints not because of the nature of the print collection, but because of the nature of the records. The print records are extremely good. The prints and drawings records um, were started out by curatorial use and trained catalogers and our staff. And I think also, so they were the first records that went out and the, the, the keeper of that department, thanks to whom, Anthony Griffiths, we have this online at all, he promoted it a lot amongst his community. So I think analyzing results of surveys has to be also taken in a larger sense. We make an assumption about a result, but it's not necessarily the true explanation in, in every case. Well, yes, I, mean, I agree. I agree wholeheartedly with your last point. I hope I gave a flavour of the fact that we have to be mindful of the type of responses we're getting and how valid this thing is. And that's where the kind of information studies thing comes in about are these responses that you're getting valid. I'm also not from the museum, so I don't have the background to a lot of these things. And I only had 40 minutes to talk about this today. I, there are other things I could talk about in more detail. I wanted to give a flavour of this physical relationship of the museum versus the, the website. And the, the, so, yes, my conclusion was maybe a little bit simplified, and there's certainly more things we can talk about there. But I hope that I was respectful about the museum as well. I, I um, you know, it's a phenomenal investment of time and effort to do this, and the response most. Po I know that you've picked up on all the negative things that you don't agree with, but I think. The fact that most of the responses from this were showing how well loved the, the, Brit the British Museum of Online Collection is. And that's something you have to take away from this. We have got you evidence to show how well loved and well respected and well used it actually is. Any other questions? I oh, yes, great. I'm actually wondering how the interface of the collection looks like. So is it possible to, if I've found one object, does it then show like Amazon? Other people who have looked at this well, also well, look at this, or are there links between the, the collection? I think it would be interesting to look at. We, um, I can't show it to you right now, but yeah, we, we, we do have um, on the page. So if you've um, found, let's say, the Rosetta Stone, and that, that stone, that, you know, that, or a, a stone, um, a, a sculpture, and it is from, um, from Greece, it is made of um, marble, and it's, um, um, I don't know. But you can click, um, on, on the, on the um, fields where it says Greece and um, marble, you can click on those terms and you will go through to the results for all of the objects that are from that term. So yes, you can navigate between, um, um, between sets, of, sets of objects. There isn't a more direct. Um, there isn't more direct um, uh, inference of, of well, you, some people who saw this also saw that. We, we haven't got that sophisticated um, um, linking at the moment. And did you do an analysis of that? Um, we haven't. Who done, goes where? No, we, we haven't. Uh, no, we haven't done an analysis of of how many people use those. Um, Another thing to say on that point as well is that the, the tools that we've got now, two years later, to do analytics are so much better than the tools that they were two years ago. So you can do much more detailed workflow through sites, where people are coming in, where people are going out, and the, look at the traffic in a lot more detail. So when we do, hopefully, repeat this over a longer period, we'll get much more um, high-level results or deeper-level results so that we can actually see these kind of things. Um, I had a question, which was, you, you talked about the reuse of pictures and about mm. how in the future you could um, do more about um, looking into how people reuse the images that they find on our collection yeah. online. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, um, it's one of the things which is very, very difficult to know. If someone's taken a web, uh, take, got an image on a web page and downloaded it for, say, book cover or that. There's a system here that you have to get permission. So we, we could get access to the permissions that people have. But then you have the whole illegal use thing too, or people just saving it and using it. And um, that's quite interesting, because in the last few years, or last six months or so, you've been able to actually start tracking and tracing where these, these images actually go to if people are reusing them online. And there are image searches that can be done to do that. So over the summer, actually, we're working with the National Gallery to look at where their image collections, their exact images when they put them online where those images those specific files go to is anyone else using them on web pages 
where, what's the distribution network of the images? And we will correlate that to the statistics of the most popular paintings to see whether there's a correlation between popular access stats and how, these, how many times. But there's always going to be people that save them to their um, hard drives and use them in lectures. You know, I don't credit all the time where I get all my images from. And I pretty much, I, I try to, I try to, especially on public lectures like this. But we've all done it, right? Right click, save. Um, so it's always going to be a bit of an issue. And images, I'm fascinated by images and how people love images and how people use images. And it's always going to be a huge issue, especially if we're trying to articulate the spread of collections and the use of collections, trying to find a way to analyse what people are doing with this stuff. And one of the things we want to follow up on is uh, what people do with the the information and the image once they've accessed it. And that is the missing link in digitization just now. What happens next? Right, thanks. There's a question at the front here, and then up, sorry, one at the front. I'm interested in the failed searches. If, the fail, if I was in retail, the people that interest me are the people who walk out without buying anything. And why things, why people download images fine, and a lot, of, a lot of it's from academic citation or publication. But why people fail and what they were looking for in the first place. I mean, I'll give you a personal example. I went onto the site months ago looking for the Staffordshire hoard. Now, that's because as a human being in the news media, I'm very interested in current things and where, do, where, where objects are and what they are. And I was fairly disappointed, to be honest, at the level of information obtained and went away sort of vaguely ungruntled. Uh, we mm -hmm. actually went to see the collection in Birmingham and found it was in New York, for example, and things like that. Um, it would be, I think, probably going to change your curatorial practice over time mm. if you get research which tells you what people were actually looking for that wasn't yet there. Do you want to take that one? Because it's you that kind of... You're, um... Yes. Um, it, is, it is interesting. And, and your point about... Um, your, I kind of make a, a, a wider point as, as well is that... Um, this, the, the collection online database it, it, well, is, is started off as a, as a curatorial internal database to, to kind of manage and store the curator's knowledge of the collection for, um, and when it was originally written, it was never kind of conceived that it would, you know, be read by the public. And, it, and it's interesting because you have to kind of, um, if the if the curator's too focused on the fact that it's being read by millions of people around the world. Um, you know, we can't let that influence how they use it and how they describe things. And you know, they've got to get on with what the best way they see fit. Um, but I, I do take your point that um, we, we we should um, you know, we should make sure there's more information about the Staffordshire Hoard, even though the objects aren't owned by the museum. But we we have done a lot of work. We did, yeah, and we we've done a lot of conservation on them. So I'll, I'll remedy that. And um, there's. Um, I, I've react, reacted quite strongly when you, you talked about images um, being illegally um, shown on other websites and used by other people, and even by right-clicking um, for lectures as if that was something we wanted to discourage. And, um, oh, no, I, don't, I just think it's something that's done, and we have to, uh, we have to uh, figure out what happens or, or how people are using this stuff to see the dissemination of information. I don't... I mean, it's something surely we want to encourage. We want people to know what we've got in the museum. And if other people are prepared to you know, do us the favour of showing them in their lectures, and, sh and it's something we really oh, want absolutely. to encourage with people. You know the Museum of Modern Art in New York? It's got the most famous art collection in the world, right? Modern art collection in the world. Yeah. And the reason it's got the most famous modern art collection in the world is right from the 1960s when it opened, or 1950s, it allowed people to use the images wherever they wanted in print media. So therefore, the paintings in the museum became the most famous modern art paintings because they relaxed the copyright laws. That's the story. And that was, that was the US government decided to do that, to take the art world away from Paris and move it to New York. So, you know, on the offline world, there is a model for this. And I'm absolutely there. People should be used. What can you do with a low resolution JPEG? You can put in a PowerPoint. You can't print a tea towel and sell it. And that's where the problem is. The problem is when people began to get money from getting the high resolution images. But I think, yeah, low resolution images, people should be allowed. It's whether or not, um, it becomes an issue when there's money involved when people are creating products. But it's interesting to see where these images... So I'm sorry if I gave the impression that it was a wrong thing to do. I think that people should say where they got the image from. Course, but that's just respectful, right? 
It's just a respect. You take something, then it's respectful to say where, you, where you've taken it from. But I'm, I wouldn't want to discourage people from uh, sharing this type of stuff. Yeah, we'll um, in, in the middle with the pen. Hello. Um, I think this is for Matthew, really. Um, you're saying that you're redesigning the search at the moment. Um, are there plans to um, actually make that more accessible to the groups that, that, that aren't using it so much and, and grow that audience at the moment? Or um, are you mainly concentrating on improving the, um, the feel of the, of the search for the academic audience? Um, we're focusing on um, improving the feel of the search for everybody so that it's easier to search. And as, as, um, one, one thing we're working on is, as, as Tanya kind of alluded to, is that to make it, to reduce the number of failed searches by having a, um, that um, autocomplete. So if you start typing into the search field, it'll, um, it'll start to guess what words you might, what words you might be searching for based on the words we have in the database. So, um, which is, so which, which kind of removes misspellings. It will also find alternative spellings of words because we've also got those in the database. So it's going to hopefully improve it for absolutely everybody. Um, the, other, the other thing is it's not just the search interval. We're improving the whole of it. I and mean, since we went online in 2007, we've, we've redesigned the website to be wider. You know, everyone has wider screens. Um, the thumbnails used to be quite small and um, we're making the thumbnails bigger so that when you get to the search results you can actually see which object see the images better so you know which one to choose so look lots of things like that i mean we're of course um we're of course constrained by the um by the way the structure the database is structured and the um you know the, the terminology we, we can't make we can't make the terminology simpler as i say you know we're not going to change the, the way the objects are catalogued because it's access, accessible to the public. You know, with two million objects, we can't go in there and say, and, and re-describe them all for a different audience. You know, that, it's not, you know, that's not the idea. It's, it's kind of there for whoever wants to use it and we'll make it as simple as possible for them. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, there was, sorry, just before, there was a question right at the back and then, thank you. Hi, um, I'm very glad to hear you're making the thumbnails in the search results larger, because that would be my, my f number one uh, criticism of the current British Museum collection, is that the thumbnails are so small you can't see what they are, even if you know what the object looks like. Um, but I was gonna, what I was going to uh, bring up was uh, just to follow on these points about reuse of images um, from uh, collection websites. A, a, a little case study that might be interesting is uh, where I work, which is a Tate website. Um, we recently redesigned our collection pages, and as part of that, we increased the size of the images that we've made available online from a, a previous maximum size of 512 pixels, which for those who don't know these things off by heart, is approximately an eighth of a computer screen area, to um, 1536 pixels, which basically would fill most of a, a computer screen normally, so they're much higher resolution. Um, and there were a bit of jitters about this internally, about you know, were we giving away all this wonderful digital content that our image library could sell um, the rights to otherwise. Um, but one of the other things we did is we added a link under each image saying, uh, license this image, which took you straight to the image library. I think the British Museum has something quite similar on the site already. Um, and as a result, we've actually doubled the revenue of the image library since launching that collection. So it hasn't actually, uh, you know, maybe more people are taking our images for free, but also more people are buying them as well as a result of a redesign. So it's not all, it's not all bad. Absolutely. Thanks. So thank you. Yeah. Um, Vicky, I'm afraid this is our last, last question all the time we have. <laughs> um, for the people who don't know what they're looking for, um, there is evidence that 
you know, they don't know what to type into a search box because they don't know what you have, mm. which is perhaps why they start out with something obvious like Rosetta Stone, because at least they know you have it. Mm. Um, but there is some evidence that browsing is also one way of getting around that problem of letting people see. It's like going to a department store. You get to browse around. You don't have to go to the department store and say, do you have X? <coughs> Um, so are you thinking about a browse capability as well? Um, we are going to have on, on the initial page we're going to have um, we're going to have links to high profile objects but also um, collections so kind of pre-made searches so um, which, which we can change so if there's an exhibition on we, we could always kind of like if there's a Chinese porcelain exhibition we could do a, um, an image with a, um, a link to um, all the results for Chinese porcelain and things like that. So we will um, we will do that. Yeah, that's planned. Sorry, it's turning into a different. No, no, it's fine. It's <laughs> fine. I mean, um, yeah, it's very interesting to hear all this because obviously I'm not from the British Museum and we were yeah. just brought in to look at the users, but to hear the improvements is. Okay, I think that's all the time we have. Um, thank you very much. I'd just like to ask you just to um, show your appreciation for Melissa once again. For her.